this. Um, we suspected that Russell Pierce was not going to show up, but we wanted the show to go on. We want to be able to say Russell Pierce didn't show up. Ob obviously, he doesn't think this issue is important enough. Um, and that's what we're going to come out with on Monday. And um, Daryl is a prominent individual in the state of Arizona. He's a long life Republican, and um, he served in a number of bishoprics with, within the LDS community. He was the individual who hosted or conducted our first fireside in Mesa at the beginning of our recall, which was extremely successful. We filled up the room uh, primarily with members of the LDS community, leaders within the LDS community, and that's sort of what brought attention with regard to Utah's stance and how Utah and the Mormon leadership in Salt Lake City um, are compassionate to the immigrant situation, and that was evident with the Utah Compact. Um, we're going to be bringing the Arizona Compact into the state of Arizona. We do have our sponsor, and um, we're excited about that, considering that this state received a bad reputation on the immigrant issue. So I want to welcome Daryl. He gives an outstanding presentation. He's a commercial trial lawyer, so he has that aura about him. And um, thank you so much. Well, I'm delighted to be here. And she said my name incorrectly. It's Daryl. Daryl. It's my mother's fault. I correct her a lot. Uh, <clears throat> and I find myself in somewhat of an unusual position because typically I'm in the courtroom where right and wrong doesn't matter. It is win or lose. And so I work to win in the courtroom, and I have an audience of eight people. And so I feel very comfortable with an eight-person uh, audience because that's uh, who I have to convince that I should win. I, I am I'm involved here because I think there's a right and wrong issue here. I got involved initially because a member of my family wanted me to be a minute man down on the border, get my gun, go down there and help patrol the border. I thought, well, okay. And, uh, but let me think about it first. Because having been a trial lawyer for 35 years, I've persuaded myself that I need to understand the issues a little more than the 30 second soundbite that you hear on television or that you hear when people are just discussing things. I was very cognizant in, in the process of this particular quote that I put up on the screen. This particular quote, quote is uh, from a book by Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud was uh, in Germany, Austria, and Hitler read his book before Sigmund Freud left. And I always thought it was interesting that uh, he pointed out and Hitler understood that a group is extraordinarily credulous, open to influence, it has no critical faculty. And so when you begin to speak in front of a group, even me in front of a group like this, you are going to have people who are for you or against you, and they're going to listen for the sound bites, and if they agree with you, they're going to agree. If they disagree, they're not going to agree. Even in the courtroom, I have found that jurors, if they accept the evidence because it fits their prejudice and predilection, then they accept it. If it's contrary to that, they go, well, he would just say that. Uh, that's because this group has no critical faculty. It doesn't exist for it. It thinks in images which call up by association. And therefore, as I've highlighted, if anyone, you need to show that. You need, are you videotaping that? Yeah, turn your camera over there and show that. Anyone who wishes to produce an effect upon it needs no logical adjustment as argument. He must paint in the most forcible colors. He must exaggerate, and he must represent the same thing again and again. If there is no issue in a case in the courtroom, the case is likely to settle. If it doesn't settle, then you end up with how do you persuade this group, and you use group psychology like this. Uh, it has always it, it interested me, therefore, that people will use these sorts of things. And of course, one of the things I liked best about the last uh, campaign in the United States 
was Mr. Obama. I thought he ran a superb campaign because he said over and over again, change you can believe in. And he was following this group psychology of what you do if you want to persuade the group. Now, there are some other things that happen uh, around, and we get things like this. Uh, and we've all laughed at this. What part of no don't you understand? And uh, people who laugh at that, they know that, well, they think that things are black and white, and that it's as simple as a yes or a no, and I myself in the courtroom have forced witnesses to answer a question with either a yes or a no, when in fact I have known as the cross-examining lawyer that the question is far more complex than that. How about this one? What part of illegal don't you understand? That is a refrain that we hear a lot in the immigration debate. And so it's very, very prevalent. The problem that we have is that people don't think deeply about the issues. Now, if Mr. Pierce were here, and he being a good Mormon, I would ask him why it was that he used repeatedly these refrains and the comments about illegality and uh, what part of illegal don't you understand and don't you know that they're, uh, they're beheading people out there. I guess that was our fine governor who was saying that. Uh, because when you are doing this, to return to my comment by Mr. Freud again, uh, what you got is argument, colors, you exaggerate, and you say the same thing over and over again. And it has impact upon those who vote because they don't think deeply. And so the challenge when you ever have a complex issue is to get people to think about it carefully so that they can understand what those issues are and therefore make uh, intelligent decisions. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a scripture out of the Mormon Doctrine and Covenants because I think Mr. Pierce ought to be thinking about this. Now you gotta understand, I'm religious. Uh, I am a Mormon. I consider myself uh, as Christian a person as there is walking upon the face of the planet because I believe that Jesus Christ is my savior and I try to follow his gospel and his precepts. I never say this in the courtroom, of course, because religion is the arena of right and wrong and moral choices. The law is not. But I think it's perfectly appropriate to consider these moral choices here. And, and, and this is a scripture in the Doctrine and Covenants. Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and your heart. There was a guy who wanted to help translate the Book of Mormon. And he thought he could just get it. And this is the revelation to him after he failed miserably. The problem that we had is lots of people think passionately with their heart but they do not do what the Lord enjoined Oliver Cowdery to do here, to work it out in your mind. And so uh, uh, then I, I just don't understand why people think they can just feel something and not think about it. Uh, so let me turn away from this religion just for a moment. And I now want to talk about uh, immigration in general. And the first thing I want to do is lay some groundwork for what I think crimes are. I'm going to blow up on the screen here what a criminal law is. Uh, criminal laws involve traditionally a particular type of evil mind. That evil mind is called mens rea in the law. You had this evil intent. <laughs> And it's not enough to have this evil intent. It's got to be active, uh, motivated by, uh, energized by, a deliberate antisocial act. And so if someone smashes in the window of your car, he's got mens rea because he intended to do that. Takes a baseball bat out and hits your car. And it's an antisocial act because it's a destruction of property. Same thing as if someone takes a knife and they kill someone. 
or they take a gun and they go into a, a store. These are traditional crimes. If, uh, they have the necessary mens rea and nocende uh, voluntas, which means you're engaging in an antisocial act. So I'm going to apply this when I talk about what's criminal and not. Unfortunately, we live in a society today where oftentimes our legislatures, uh, whether it's wise or not, and I think it's not wise, uh, decide to make things that are criminal that in fact don't involve an evil mind with an intention to disrupt the uh, uh, society in which we live. <clears throat> I want to talk about a little bit of the history of the immigration laws. The Naturalization Act, of 1795 uh, said free white persons five years in the United States can be a citizens. Uh, in 1801, it was amended to require 14 years, and that was it. It was a live here for five years and then 14 years. 1802, they reduced it again to five years. And then with the greedy, uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, uh, the 80,000 Mexicans who were living in that region were just made citizens because now they're within the continental boundaries of the United States, so we'll just make them citizens. They lived there long enough, and that was enough. Uh, 1870, we began some uh, uh, post Civil War sentiments that have matured into what we have today. Uh, we started with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Uh, this Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was precipitated because of very strong feelings that people had against the Chinese. Uh, the Statue of Liberty was just deli delivered here by France, and so we find this political car uh, cartoon from the Wasp in 1881, and there's some rays radiating from the coolie standing in place of the Statue of Liberty, and these rays up here say, let me show you what they say, filth, immorality, diseases, ruin to white labor. The exact same uh, complaints that are made about uh, Hispanic migration and Mexicans coming across the border today. This was not new, because even before the Civil War, we had people in the United States who thought that the United States ought to be pure, whatever that was. Ben Franklin did not like the swarms of Germans flooding Pennsylvania in the 1750s. Yes, the 1750s before we were a country. They didn't learn the language. They kept it themselves. He thought it was awful. He thought we ought to exclude those Pennsylvania Germans. Samuel Morris, who invented the, uh, uh, did the Morris Code, he just hated the Irish Catholics. He thought Catholics ought to be kept out of America, particularly if they were Irish because they drank. Uh, and he was a part of a, a political party in the uh, middle of the 17, 1850s called the Nativist Party, where they believed that if you were not born in the United States, you shouldn't be a citizen because it's only natives who should be here their ancestors got here, but well, by jingo, uh, the doors are closed now, so let's not have them. This hatred of the Irish uh, Catholics, by the way, continued uh, into the 1920s. Here's a political cartoon from 1928, uh, and you can see we've got we've got Rome, rum, and red. We got a wall. We've got immigrants, there's a sign over that. Here's Uncle Sam saying nothing doing. You're not gonna let these uh, Roman Catholics who drink rum and have red hair, i.e. have red hair, i.e. the Irish, come in to the United States. The problem with this is, of course, that these people are very narrow in their thinking. Uh, and they think that there ought to be some laws that ought to be enforced because the law, after all, is the law. One of my favorite laws that was ever broken was by Thomas Paine, who wrote Common Sense. Common Sense was a treasonous tract. It 
did more to incite America's Revolutionary War than any other thing that was written. And the preamble to this said, let me do that just a little bit differently here, that perhaps the sentiments expressed in this tract uh, are not yet fashionable and have general favor. The long habit of thinking something is wrong gives it the superficial appearance of right, raises a formidable outcry to defense, but in fact, when time is taken and people think about it, they can understand that indeed, uh, maybe there was some common sense in what happened here. He had to publish common sense anonymously because he would have been hunted down and uh, probably hanged for what he uh, did. In the 1920s, returning back to that, when we have that wall for the Irish Catholics, we had a bill that was introduced by one Senator uh, Reed. Uh, I kind of like Senator Reed because he uh, thought, again, that America ought to be American. So he passed an immigration law that was a law for those of us who are interested in keeping America's stock up to the highest standard, those, uh, that is, people who were born here. And unfortunately, we still see people today who think that America ought to be populated only by people who were born here. And they are oblivious to the advantages that come from having people who come here because they want a chance. They want to live the American dream. They, they don't want to be uh, oppressed in their country. And they come here because they want to work and earn money for themselves and their families. They want to engage in the freedom of free enterprise in America. Senator Reed, uh, David Reed, when he uh, passed this law, uh, <clears throat> thought that uh, America's doors should be shut, I suppose. And this is the beginning of the doctrine of eugenics, by the way, that uh, animated uh, Hitler in Europe, because he thought that there was such a thing as a pure race of people who uh, in the 1920s, we had quotas that were enacted for immigration. Those quotas have remained in force more or less since then, and we still have that system today, although modified during the 1960s because of the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act then. But still, it's just this kind of quota system where if you're a high school graduate in Mexico and you want to come here and you want to get in line, it's going to take you somewhere between 100 and 20 and 140 years of standing in line to get the necessary visa to live here in the United States. So why are there uh, why are there restrictions on immigrants? Uh, I've just never understood it. Uh, if you've got such economic pressure that people will walk across the Sonoran Desert with a milk bottle full of water to get here and live and to work hard. That's economic pressure. Uh, that is a tidal wave that is causing people to come here to work and better their position in life. There was a, uh, a king who ruled England and Scandinavia in the 1200s. It's King Canut, Canut the Great. He uh, set up his throne on the beaches in England and ordered the sea to stop so that it wouldn't get his feet wet. And uh, well, didn't work very well, so he decided he had to move his, uh, his throne because he could not command the sea. And he thought that maybe only God should be able to do that. So what happens when you've got someone saying, stop, don't come? Uh, and you've got quotas, you get a black market because people are going to come anyway. We have black markets all the time in the free enterprise system when we try to regulate it. Uh, take minimum wage. I don't like minimum wages. I am against that type of government regulation. But if you have it and you have to pay somebody whatever the minimum wage is today to work for you and somebody else comes and says they'll do it for half that, 
you're probably going to hire the guy who's going to do it for half that. And that's a black market in the labor industry. And so regulating that means you've got a black market. Well, then I look at all these people who are in favor of immigration. Uh, I got the Cato Institute, uh, a very conservative, right-wing, libertarian group. And they're in favor of open borders. Not unregulated unregul borders, not unsecure borders, but borders that allow people uh, to come and go freely, it's much like the Bracero program in the 50s and early 60s, where people were free to come to the United States. And guess what happened to the illegal immigration problem during that period of time? It went away. Because people could come in freely. They could go home when they wanted, and it wasn't a problem. I love this particular video that's on the internet because it describes for me exactly what the problem is that we have today or a problem that I don't understand because this is uh, George H.W. Bush and Ronald Reagan debating and they're asked a question that, well, I just love this question. Listen to this. I'm going to ask you what you can do about Cuba. But now, we're going to, <laughs> now we're going to ask some questions from the audience. Yes, my name is David Grossberg, and I'd like to know, do you think the children of illegal aliens should be allowed to attend Texas public schools free, or do you think that their parents should pay for their education? I think you're addressing that. Sir. I think you're first. I was looking right at you. That's a crazy question. Look, I'd like to see something done about the illegal alien problem that would be so sensitive and so understanding about labor needs and human needs that that problem wouldn't come up. But today, if those people are here, uh, I would reluctantly say I think they would they would get whatever it is that they're, you know, what the society is giving to their neighbors. But it has, the problem has to be solved. The problem has to be solved because with, if we have kind of made illegal, sometimes a labor that I'd like to see legal, we're doing two things. We're creating a whole society of really honorable, decent, family-loving people that are in violation of the law, and secondly, we're exacerbating relations with Mexico. The, the, the answer to your question is much more fundamental than whether they attend Houston schools, it seems to me. I don't want to see a whole, if they're living here, I don't want to see a whole thing of six and eight-year-old kids being made, you know, one totally uneducated and made to feel that they're living with outside the law. Let's address ourselves to the fundamentals. These are good people, strong people. Part of my family is an action. I think the time has come that the United States and our neighbor, particularly our neighbor to the South, should have a better understanding and a better relationship than we've ever had. And I think that we haven't been sensitive enough to our size and our power. They have a problem of 40 to 50 percent unemployment. Now, this cannot continue without the possibility arising with regard to that other country that we talked about, of Cuba and what it is stirring up, of the possibility of trouble below the border and we could have a very hostile and strange neighbor on our border. Rather than making them or talking about putting up a fence, why don't we work out some recognition of our mutual problems make it possible for them to come here legally with a work permit, and then while they're working and earning here, they pay taxes here. And when they go want to go back, they can go back, and they can cross and open the border both ways by understanding their problems. This is... You know, I kind of like this video because uh, uh, President Bush, as you can see on that, started out sort of meandering around, and he sort of came to his senses as he was talking realizing that it's a more complex issue, and that's where he finally settled. But I thought that was uh, very effective thinking on his feet because his initial reaction was like the initial reaction of all, almost everyone to, well, it's illegal, don't you know? So just, just, just watch this again uh, and see, see what you think of how his opinion matures. I'm going to ask you what you can do about Cuba. But now, we're going to, <laughs> now we're going to ask some questions from the audience. Yes, 
My name is David Grossberg, and I'd like to know, do you think that children of illegal aliens should be allowed to attend Texas public schools free, or do you think that their parents should pay for their education? I think we're addressing that. Uh, I'll take you first. I'm just, uh, looking right at you. I think you would. Look, I'd like to see something done about the illegal alien problem that would be so sensitive and so understanding about labor needs and human needs that that problem wouldn't come up. But today, if those people are here, uh, I would reluctantly say I think they would they would get whatever it is that they're, you know, what the society is giving to their neighbors. But you see, here's a problem in America. We, uh, we have an eliminationary attitude. We are charitable people. Christians are that way. And so you want to give to people and help them and lift them up. And we do that with billions and billions of dollars of foreign aid. And it's just anomalous, it seems to me, that we have people living here in America and we would say, oh, we're not going to educate you. Or <laughs> you shouldn't be here. Or we're going to deport you, but we're going to spend all these billions of dollars doing other things. I think it is important also to realize that these people are not a burden on our country or economy. It's easy to say, well, they take tax dollars from us. But there was a study that was done in Texas that showed that <clears throat> the net effect of having illegal immigrants, undocumented, paperless people, was $424.7 million to the good in the state of Texas when they figured all it cost them and what they got in tax, re tax revenues. Now, this study is uh, some years old, but there are more recent studies that, uh, that witness the exact same thing. In fact, if you go to the Cato Institute, that libertarian right-wing organization, they repeatedly say, you know, it's just imponderable what the benefit is of these people to our economy here in the United States. There's problems with Social Security, I know. Well, the problems with Social Security is that we have lots of illegal immigrants who are paying Social Security with no expectation of getting it. As a result, there is six to seven billion dollars annually that goes into the fund that doesn't come out. And the people paying it in, they're not expecting to get it out because they're using someone else's social security number or a false number. And so who cares? I don't understand why we care about that. A man called me just about two, uh, earlier this week. Yeah, he's the owner of a laundry here in town. He's had a woman working for him for 15 years, one of the best workers that he's ever had. She is Hispanic. She has kids here. Uh, the immigration people came knocking at his door, though, because she had been using someone's, someone else's Social Security number for 15 years. The employer didn't know it, but now the uh, Social Security Administration found out about it because the person whose number it really was went on disability, started receiving disability benefits, but payments kept coming in under the numbers, uh, uh, and so they went to investigate, and she had to quit her job and flee like, well, I guess like she was an illegal. Not like the American that she was, not like or is, not like someone who works hard to make a living and to live free and do the American dream. And so I wonder why we make those people uh, illegal in our society today. Uh, one of the big problems that we have with the Arizona debate is that people think that there's much more crime because of illegal immigration. And they spout that, just like Sigmund Freud said, because, well, you know, it's popular to say that, you want to say it, and the point of the fact, though, is that it's just not true. Violent crime in Arizona from 2008 was the lowest it had ever been since 1971. Uh, property crime rates fell. Uh, you've got nothing that indicates that there's any increased crime because of illegal immigrants. This particular study is done by Daniel Griswold. I know Daniel Griswold. I spoke with him on a panel a week ago. 
two weeks ago. He is uh, a perceptive scholar of what statistics really are, and he understands what all of us need to understand, and what that is is that the talk and the uh, hyperbolic speech about immigrants without paperwork or illegal immigrants causing crimes is not so. Empirical studies and statistics do not bear it up. It is simply not something that happens. Uh, here's a, uh, uh, <coughs> free trade bulletin from the Cato Institute that addresses another issue that immigrants uh, are accused of, uh, uh, of having a problem with. This free trade bulletin says, interestingly, that as Americans, uh, let me go to the next page of this, that as Americans <clears throat> become more and more educated, and so the total population with no high school education among the whites has dropped. Uh, those people don't want to take uh, the lowest level, entry level jobs. They don't want to go out to the fields and work. And so the problem is, is that we begin to have a deficiency in people who are going to be supportive, who are actually going to go to the fields and do the work that needs to be done. And so if we exclude those people from our country, then what we get is <clears throat> low-skilled workers who are not there and nobody doing the job, and as was appeared in a newspaper article uh, just, I think it was uh, either yesterday or today in the Arizona Republic. Uh, let me see if I can find that real quickly. Uh, our good friends in Alabama passed a law that uh, <laughs> sweeping laws hurt the innocent, it says here. And this editorial yesterday I thought was uh, kind of interesting because it recognized that, <clears throat> here's lesson one, state laws that take a meat ax to illegal immigration hurt the innocent, intimidates school children, honest working stiffs cannot be cannot be justified simply because, uh, no, it just makes these people illegal citizens. Uh, it also then says, we need to face the facts. Folks, including some in Arizona, see collateral damage as an acceptable in the larger battle against illegal immigration. Their anger and frustration are profound because the federal government has not dealt with the issue, and so the issue is, and I think Mr. Pierce, for example, is among these people. Uh, they want to say, well, we got to do something. Nobody else will. So we're just going to do it without regard to what the broader and more important issues are. Simply put, the nation needs migrant labor. Arizona's laws puts a big red, uh, Alabama's laws put a big red circle on that because in Alabama, they're having crops rock in the field because if they hire the Americans to do it, uh, they'll last for two or three days, but they don't get the work done. And uh, very few people I've met are harder workers than uh, Hispanics who work hard. That's lesson number two. There are just some jobs that Americans with their higher education don't want. Uh, we need the entry-level immigrant, whether Hispanic or from any other country, that will do those jobs. Uh, part three, <laughs> uh, there is no federal program that gets us the necessary workers that we need. And so you often find a black market importing workers that are needed because the economic pressure is there. It's kind of like King Canuck. You can't enact a law that tries to stand in the way of the tides, whether it's the tides of the ocean or the economic tides that motivate and animate our free enterprise system. I thought this was an interesting article that appeared in Forbes magazine not too long ago. 
is a magazine article that recognizes that most of the pioneers in America, well, they're illegal. Uh, in the early 19th century, uh, the United States adopted homestead acts that required people, let people have land if they paid a fee and they could cultivate the land. And so what happened? People didn't pay the fee. They went out and just squatted on land. And so the United States government sent troops out there to uh, throw them off. But the problem was there were so many people out there who were illegal squatting on the land, the, the U.S. military wasn't large enough to throw them off. Uh, and so uh, they had to come up with a different scheme. Well, the different scheme that they came up with was uh, uh, to just change the law because the crackdowns failed. They couldn't evict them. And so what they ended up doing was changing the law. Let me uh, show you the second page of this article. Can't change the law, can't enforce the law, so what we did was change the law. <clears throat> Congress finally acknowledged there was a problem. They passed the 1862 Homestead Act and this is the one you see in the movies, where people line up with the wagons, and they shoot the gun, and people race across Oklahoma to stake their land, and it doesn't cost them anything. Because, well, the government finally figured out they couldn't keep the illegals off the land, so why not go ahead and make it legal? People still flock to the United States, seeking a better life. They do it the same reason that the early settlers in America did, uh, <clears throat> many have come, even though our government uses harsh crackdowns like they did in the early 19th century to try to keep those people at, back. And uh, <laughs> they argue that allowing these people to stay rewards law-breaking and under undermines America's values. Well, all those illegal squatters in the 19th century, uh, that wasn't the problem that they had. And in fact, they epitomized what America was at the time because these were exactly what we want in America, the people who are willing to go out uh, and have a job. And so we need to provide a path to legitimacy for these people because they are the essence of what America is. They are not un-American, they are the sort of thing that has made America great. Today's undocumented immigrants exemplify the American character far more than those who angrily insist that they wait in line until we fix our immigration system. It just does not work that way. I, uh, I talked to many of my friends who are insisting upon fixing the system first. And I said, you know, one of the things that frustrates me a lot is to have an accident in the road ahead of me on my way to work uh, because it backs up traffic. And so the natural reaction, of course, is for everyone who's backed up on the road to start turning off the road and cutting through the neighborhoods to get around the accident. And it's not really legal for those people to turn off the main road and cut through the residential neighborhoods to avoid the accident down there, but they're gonna do it anyway the solution to this criminal activity is not to set police at uh, every corner to keep people from going through the neighborhoods. The solution is to clear the roadblock. And then people don't have to cut through the neighborhoods. I've, I've never understood why people don't understand this simplest of solutions to a problem that makes people seem as though they're illegal when they don't have that traditional element of criminal intent to upset society. You have some poor working guy who's here without paperwork. He doesn't want to commit a crime. He wants to go to work. He wants to get paid. He wants to come home. He wants to buy food. He's paying taxes. He wants to support his family. He's not the thing that's disrupting our society. 
other people are doing that. In fact, we have a bigger problem from people who have been on the dole in the United States for years and generations, and they expect that this government owes them something. The paperless immigrant doesn't think that. In fact, most new immigrants don't think that at all. They are here to live the, Amor uh, the American dream. They don't want uh, what has happened uh, in our society because we have developed an entitlement society. And we somehow think that, well, if these people come, uh, we're gonna have to give away more entitlements. Well, if that's your problem, then worry about the entitlements. Don't worry about these people who add to our economy and make it the vibrant uh, country that it is. Now, uh, I, I'm appalled that people think that they should obey the law just because it's the law. It's that what part of illegal don't you understand thing? Uh, certainly, I'm a lawyer. I don't believe in going out and violating the law. Uh, I don't support that. I, I think it's regrettable that I have many, many dozens of Hispanic friends who are here without paperwork because it is a, quote, technical violation of the law. But that does not prevent me from saying these are people who are good people and we need to change this law so that they are not here illegally, just like we changed the law with the Homestead Act in the early 19th century when we realized it was just a dumb law. It was a bad law and we needed to fix it. You know, prohibition was a bad law. Uh, we passed uh, the 19th Amendment prohibiting the sale of liquor in the United States. People kept drinking liquor anyway. They just had to, and we, uh, we had bootleggers and we had speakeasies. And so now we have the government trying to enforce something that can't be enforced. What do you think would have happened if before we passed the uh, 21st Amendment, repealing the 19th, <clears throat> we just said, okay, first thing we got to do is we got to catch all those bootleggers and close down all the speakeasies. That wasn't the answer to the problem of this bad law. The answer was eliminate that stupid law and all those other problems, well, they went away. Uh, if we have a bad law, that's what we should be trying to do. What about... Uh, United States when we were formed. You know, we dumped tea in the Boston Harbor. It was a crime to do that. It was a crime to have the Declaration of Independence. It was a crime for Thomas Paine to do common sense. Uh, it uh, used to be a capital offense in England to have a vernacular Bible. Had a, a Bible written in English. They caught you with it. They would burn you at the stake because that was a criminal offense. It wasn't really until King James in the early 17th century decided to make it a political thing. He translate the King James Bible and kind of unite these different parts of England that uh, had in this vernacular Bible came to be an accepted thing. In Germany, it was a crime to harbor Jews, and yet some people did it. Uh, we interned Japanese in World War II here. Uh, Rosa Parks didn't go to the back of the bus. Uh, even if you look at the Mormon history, you can find that Joseph Smith, when he was martyred in Carthage, was a fugitive and there was an arrest warrant out for him. So if you look at kind of black and white statements, and I'm going to show you one here from the Mormon church. Here it is. It's an article of faith. And many Mormons talk about this article of faith a great deal. It's Article 12. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates, and obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. Well, yeah, that's true. Everybody does. Everyone in this room believes that. But the simple, what part of illegal don't you understand, does not help us with sustaining the law and what that really means. So if you go to the Doctrine and Covenants of the Mormon Church, you then find this statement. We believe that the commission of crime should be punished according to the nature of the offense, according to their criminality and their tendency to evil among men. And for the public peace and tranquility, all men should step forward and use their ability to bring offenders against good laws to punishment. Wow. 
the Mormon church never once believed that in Germany you should turn in a Jew to the Nazis because it was the law. It was not a good law. And so you don't find Mormon people in Germany in World War II sustaining this bad law. In fact, you don't find good Christians anywhere doing the same thing either, or really anyone with any moral principle thinking that's a good law and that we need to sustain that. So what we have to do is we have to decide what is and is not a good law. Uh, the Mormon Church has gone a long way towards uh, helping us with that, helping me with that, helping members of the Mormon Church with that, because they have adopted uh, a the Utah Compact. They helped promote it. Uh, the Utah Compact, as I'm sure most of us here are aware, uh, provides for the legalization of people without paperwork. It gives them driver's licenses, lets them get a job, lets them be here legally, but only in Utah. And of course, that law's been attacked because they think, well, because the, 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 the national federal government thinks that this is a federal issue, so they don't like Utah's laws. But here's what the church said about this, that uh, the Mormon church follows Jesus Christ. We follow that and believe that we should love our neighbors. And the Savior taught neighbor includes all of God, God's children in all places and at all times. There's an ever-present need to strengthen the family. Families are meant to be together. Forced separation of working parents from their children weakens families and damages society. How can we live in a society where the sheriff of Maricopa County can go arrest a mother or a father and deport them, leaving their children here, when the only offense that that person has is not some sort of uh, offense against the peace of society, but because they're working uh, here in Mesa at City Hall cleaning toilets, for example. So let's deport those people and let's break up the families. That is not the Mormon ethic or a Christian ethic. Now, every nation has the right to enforce and secure its laws and its borders, and all, nation, all, and all persons are subject to the laws and are accountable for their acts in relation to them. Of course, that's true, but that doesn't mean those of us in this room should be sustaining bad laws because bad laws hurt our country and we should not allow them to control. Public officials should create and administer laws that reflect the best of our aspirations as a just and caring society. Tell me if SB 1070 represents the best of our aspirations. It cannot because it does the very things that any Christian any Mormon, any person with morals should despise and eschew. It allows families to be broken up. It keeps people who only want to work hard from working. It makes people second class citizens because they're afraid to go out and, uh, and be seen. Uh, I had uh, a young Hispanic lady that was working in my office. She was the receptionist. She was 19 years old. Uh, I come, come in, she's, uh, she was born in Mexico. Uh, I come into work one morning, and she's crying. Tears are going down her face. And so I walk right by her because I'm not in charge of management at my firm. I have an office manager who's in charge of personnel management. But I walk right back to my manager's office and say, what's, what's, wrong with, uh, what's wrong with Tatiana? She says, well, she's gotten papers to be deported. See, she was carried here when she was two years old. And her mother, who had received the green card, uh, had been not working very hard at getting the necessary paperwork for her to be legal. And someone at the uh, immigration office had gotten her birth date wrong. And so instead of being just 19, uh, they thought that she was over 21 and she'd be deported because she didn't have paperwork. Wow, I didn't understand the stupidity of that kind of immigration law in any event, because she's been here since she was two years old. 
It's the only country she knows. She stood up and pledged allegiance to our flag every day when she went to school. She loved working at my firm. I loved her having her work there. And so, well, okay, just because 17 years ago her mother carried her here, she now has to go back to Mexico where she has no connections, no family, no friends. Is that good luck? Well, we hired an immigration lawyer for her, someone who worked at the Florence Immigration and Naturalism and Immigration Fund, which I support. I give them lots of money because they have great lawyers doing things. And but for hiring this lawyer, she would have been deported. And I wonder how many other people are treated abruptly and inhumanely worse than if they were animals by our immigration laws that are just bad laws. We need to fix and change those. So, uh, now, what has the church done? Uh, the Mormon church? They had the presiding bishop of the church appear at the signing ceremony of a bill, of the bill in Utah that allowed people without paperwork to square themselves with the law, to keep their job to get a driver's license and to work. And so the presiding bishop appears there and says our presence here testifies to the fact that we are appreciative of what has happened in the legislature this session. Well, uh, this made a lot of press in Utah. Uh, there were a lot of Mormons who are somewhat like just a lot of the Mormons in Mesa. And they're thinking about a quarter of an inch deep so the church then had to come up with an official statement of what to do with these people, and here's the official statement. It is given out in June of 2011, and it says, <clears throat> church, most Americans agree that the federal government of the United States should secure its border and sharply reduce or eliminate the flow of undocumented immigrants. You know, people ought to have documents when they come here. Although I will tell you that I'm sort of an undocumented citizen of the United States. Because I don't have a social security card. I got my social security card when I started working in Mexico when I was 16. I haven't seen that social security card for more than... Uh, more than 45 years. So I guess uh, if I had to go get a job and show my social security card, I couldn't get one. Now I do have a driver's license, and I do remember my social security number, and I do use it, and I really was born in the United States, and I can produce my birth certificate, but you know, it doesn't have my, doesn't have my picture on it. It doesn't have my fingerprints or my footprints. And so I just show them this certified copy of my birth certificate, and I wonder how people think I am documented or why I have paper, but you know, I don't think it matters because I'm devoted to this country. I pledge allegiance to its flag. I support its laws. And if somebody else wants to do that same thing here in America, then I say, why shouldn't they be here? Why shouldn't that be part of what makes you a citizen? As a matter of policy, the Church of Jesus Christ discourages its members from entering without legal documentations and from Overstaying their legal travel visas. Yeah, that's a matter of policy. Yeah, we discourage that. Uh, we're going to see in a minute that sometimes this official policy, which, which I subscribe to, uh, recognizes that there can be exceptions. The bedrock moral issue for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is how we treat each other as children of God. The Church is concerned that any state legislation that only contains enforcement provisions is likely to fall short of the high moral standards of how we treat our brothers and sisters, children of God. The church supports an approach where undocumented immigrants are allowed to square themselves with the law to continue to live here and not be split up by the sorts of laws that we have here in Arizona. In furtherance of this, the church believes, the Mormon church believes, that <clears throat> Then we support a balanced and simple approach
to a challenging problem, fully consistent with the tradition of compassion, reverence for the family, and commitment to the law. Now, the LDS Church supported the, the Utah Compact. It would not have passed in a legislature that has over 80% Mormons in the legislature of Utah, unless the Mormon Church would support it. The Mormon Church sent lobbyists to the legislature to adopt that law. <clears throat> I, I don't speak for the church. I'm a member of the Mormon Church. Uh, the church can speak for itself. They have official people who do that. I'm not one of those. But I cannot understand how someone like Russell Peters can stand up at a legislative district 18 meeting and say, the church supports what I do. I've been told by church leaders that what I do is correct and honest. I, as a lawyer, when I saw him say that, and I listened to the tone of his voice, I said to myself, I would like to cross-examine that guy because what he's saying is not the truth. The church did not say that to him, and the church does not support him for that. And here is a man who's trying to use the church as the springboard for his political office, and it just is not right. Now, here's an interesting sidelight of Mormon Church. Uh, it's headed by a prophet. In uh, <clears throat> there was a man from out near Safford, Arizona, named Spencer W. Kimball, who was the prophet of our church for a while. And I revered him as a prophet like Moses, and like Abraham, and Isaac. Jacob, uh, I think he was a prophet. I still think that. The issue of baptizing, quote, illegal immigrants came up in the Mormon church while President Kimball was the head of our church. Our church is organized with a quorum of 12 apostles immediately under the president of the church. It's like the 12 apostles agently, and they counsel and give him advice. And so at the time this issue came up, uh, there was a discussion with a faction of the 12 apostles saying, you know, you can't baptize them. They are illegal. They're here illegally. You cannot do it. Now, President Kimball was a, is a, was a consensus builder. He liked to have people agree with what he did. But in this particular instance, I just really like what he did. Here it is. 